Chris, welcome to Waterstones. Thanks, Will. It's very uh, nice to be here. We're going to talk about ultra-processed people, which is going to take us into discussion about ultra-processed food. Maybe it would be helpful, to begin with, to start off with a definition. What is UPF? So, there's a long definition that we use for research. It's 11 paragraphs long. I am one of a very small number of people who's read the whole thing. The working definition, if you are eating something, you want to know if it's UPF, is you look on the ingredients list and if there's something on that list that you don't know what it is or you don't normally find it in a domestic kitchen like xanthan gum or diacetyl tartaric acid as esters of mono and diglycerides of fatty acids, then it's ultra processed food. There are other definitions that work quite well. Like if there is a health claim on the packet, like if it says supports your family's health as it does on certain cereal packs, then it's almost certainly ultra processed. Anything that claims to be low fat, low sugar, those things are all ultra processed. Okay, so you've just mentioned the sort of breakfast cereal is, was one of your things. You're a fan of Cocoa Pops and they're a problem. And in fact, if you look at all cereals, they'll often say things like fortified with vitamins and iron, which is a health claim. And that would be an alarm bell because you're thinking there must be something up here. Real food is not fortified with vitamins and iron. If you eat a steak or a piece of fish or yeah. some broccoli or you know, some actual whole grains, they're not fortified. They're just, they contain those things. Mm. The reason that we back add vitamins and minerals to ultra processed food is because they've been removed by all the processing. So flat, flour is not ultra processed, but flour by law has to be fortified because it's quite low nutrient. Mm. But almost all breakfast cereal is, is fortified here. I had a check of my breakfast. I tried to have a healthy breakfast. So I had- There's no some, judgment here. Well, I had, I had some Greek yogurt and I was worried that there might be some additives there, but actually, no, fine, all good. And I had a slice of toast, seeded, you know, mm. one of those nice, healthy yeah. looking seeded yeah. things. And it did contain mono and diacetyl tartaric acid esters of mono and diglycerides of fatty acids. There you go. Mm -mm. <laughs> Everyone's favorite ingredient. So that is called, that's also known as datem, and there are some emulsifiers like it. And that is part of what makes your bread last for a very long time without going stale. It holds some moisture into the crumb. But it also creates, um, uh, it, it textures the bread. So, so the kind of bread you ate, you've eaten for breakfast isn't really bread. Bread mm. is made of wheat and salt and water, and that's it. The bread you've eaten is an emulsified foam of very low grade flour with back added protein, palm fat. There's probably some sugar in there and they often add flavorings. Mm. It's not, doesn't really meet the definition of bread. And there's a, there's a movement that bread should be a protected term, that things that contain palm fat and emulsifiers shouldn't really be called bread, they're emulsified industrial foams. So the reason why this is a problem, of course, is you're looking at this idea of, of obesity uh, and why that's a problem and what's causing it. And as you say on the front of the book, it's, it's not you, it's the food. So there are various sort of, I guess, myths in a way that you're trying to sort of break down. Um, one of the most eye-opening moments in the book for me was when you talk about obesity and how some people who are obese actually exhibit symptoms of malnourishment so that their growth can be quite stunted, which is what you would expect to see from somebody who wasn't eating enough. And that shows that the food that they are eating isn't giving them the nourishment that they should get. Is that right? So there are three synergistic pandemics happening at the world, in the world at the moment. There is a, a pandemic of obesity and weight gain. There is a pandemic of malnutrition, stunting, and there is a pandemic of climate change. And these three problems are interlocked and they affect the same people in the same way. And to solve any one of them, you do need to solve the other two. The, the, the food system is a, is a massive driver of climate change, it's the ultra processed food system. So in the UK, a five year old, so I've got a three year old and a six year old, is that much shorter, nine centimeters shorter than their counterparts in Eastern Europe, Northern Europe or Scandinavia. So that's wow. at the age of five. And the same is true in the States. So obesity and malnutrition and stunting uh, coincide in the same uh, households, but in the same bodies, the two go hand in hand. And that's why when we talk about ultra processed food, we're, we're not just talking about uh, its ability to drive weight gain. That's the thing for which we have very good evidence. Mm. Um, we're really talking about early death from all causes. So, so poor diet, which is ultra processed food, has overtaken tobacco as the leading cause of early death mm. on planet Earth for humans and for animals, actually. So this is a huge problem. And the data we have on ultra processed food, this isn't, I haven't written a book about one study. Mm. We've got probably 2000 papers that we can use to evidence the hypothesis that ultra processed food is a serious cause of health problems. But within that 2000 papers, we've got around 80 prospective 
clinical studies. And these are the kind of studies that we use to show that tobacco products cause lung cancer and lung disease. And so this is incredibly robust research. You know, the, the jury is very much in on this. And the book makes the argument, I, I hope, that what we need is, is government intervention. Because this is, it really isn't the fault of anyone who's living with diet-related disease. Mm. This is just the water we swim in and the air we breathe. Another uh, eye-opening moment is when you talk about poverty and how there are genetic risk factors towards obesity and, and food addiction, I suppose, um, but you put, make the point that the food environment that you grow up in can actually have an impact on that. Yeah, so some of my readers and people will come back to me and say, well, my problem isn't really ultra-processed food. My problem is, is poverty, is stress, is trauma, I'm an emotional eater. What we know from the data is that the people who say that, the foods that they binge on, that they feel addicted to, are almost always ultra-processed foods. Mm. And so UPF is one of the ways that the harms of poverty are manifested. For many people in this country, it is the only food they can afford, it's the only food that's available, it's the only food they have the equipment and time to prepare. So they're essentially forced to eat this food. Mm. So. Um, it goes hand in hand with gambling, alcohol, tobacco, vaping as a set of addictive substances that are poorly regulated and which spectacularly harm people who are already disadvantaged. So we have a food apartheid, you know, people with money, if you, we know that if you give people without money money, they always make sensible decisions, mm. you know. People who live without money are, uh, are unfortunate, they're not stupid, they haven't made bad choices. Mm. And we know that when you give people lots of money, they generally just don't eat much ultra-processed food. So one of the messages that the food industry tries to say is, oh, if you want to regulate ultra-processed food, you're actually taking away choice, you're limiting freedom. And it, absolutely, that is not in any way what we're doing. We want to reduce misinformation and we want to promote healthy, nutritious food to be affordable and available. Mm. The moment people don't have a choice. One of the classic ways of determining sometimes scientific results is, is to use twins. And of course you are a twin. Right. And you point out in your book that there was a point at which uh, your, brother was, uh, your brother's arm was in Boston. Yeah. yeah. In what you described as a food swamp. What, what do you mean by a food swamp? So, so, so in America they have food deserts where, and people, if you've traveled in America and you go to these sort of strip malls, there is no food. You cannot buy an apple. You can't buy anything with a single ingredient. This is all pre-prepared uh, uh, ultra-processed food. Food swamps are a bit different because in Boston, as we have in the UK, there's often like lots of good food around, mm. but it's submerged beneath the mud of ultra-processed food. So mm. in the UK, Leicester is, a, you know, Leicester is one of the places I talk about, but th these food swamps are everywhere. I mean, they're, 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 there's one near me where, sure, there is a shop selling healthy food, but you've got to walk past three chicken shops uh, a kebab shop and a, and, a, and a corner shop to get there and yeah. those only sell ultra processed food and they are the affordable options and they're often marketed to you as as you know re really aggressively. And at that time when he was in the food swamp he was 20 kilograms heavier than you were you point out yeah because he's surrounded by that sort of he was he was he had a very stressful period in his life and he he lived above a burger bar and he put on a huge amount of weight we both have the genetic risk factors for weight gain yeah as many people do I was protected by stability in my life. I didn't have the same level of stress. I hadn't moved continents. I had a steady job. Mm. And so I didn't gain the same amount of weight. If you'd, if you'd swapped us around, I would have yeah. had the same experience. So people who live with genetic vulnerability to obesity have the daily experience that they are to blame. And all of my patients say this to me, and I have this experience because I, I, you know, I'm slightly overweight and I, I have these genetic risk factors, and it is a terrible struggle for me. If there was food on that table over there, I would be, you know, <laughs> it, it would be distracting in a way that cigarettes would be to a smoker. Yeah. And so there is the impression, uh, uh, people who live, at, who are naturally slim, don't have those, those genetic risk factors. So they find it very easy not to eat the biscuits. People with, who are food obsessed, who have those genetic risks, mm. you know, uh, experience this constant failure of will. If you're someone who like, when you plan a holiday, if your itinerary is restaurants and <laughs> menus and food markets, then you have genetic risk factors for, for, for obesity. Yeah. You know, it's all food behavior.
It's a bit like you've looked at my holiday itinerary there. That was... It's like, and, you know, but, but all kinds of things protect us. You know, the household we grow up in and the, the foods, whether we have money for real food and, mm. you know, what our partner likes to feed and what our kids do, you know. There's all this stuff that can... So it's not destiny, but if you put people in, in a situation of poverty and stress, then, then people like you and I will gain weight. Willpower is one of the things that you say it is not about um, in the book. And another one is exercise. People are often told that if they just exercise more, they would be able to, to lose their yeah. weight. But we know now that that is just simply not the case. So with willpower, I mean, willpower is really important to destroy the willpower argument. So um, there are so many ways you can do it. The argument has no moral or economic or scientific validity whatsoever. But the, the simplest way is just to go, in the United States, black, white, Hispanic groups of all ages, men and women, all gained weight at the same moment, mid-1970s. Now, they didn't all have a failure of moral responsibility at the same moment. You know, that's absurd. What happened was the food environment changed and all the food was becoming more and more ultra-processed. So that was the inflection point. There's lots of other experimental data showing it's nothing to do with willpower. My patients who live with obesity have often lost half their body weight many times over. They have incredible willpower. And we have no evidence that these people lack willpower in any other dimension of their life. So it, it, is, it is a nonsense. Whenever we study willpower, it turns out to be a proxy, usually for poverty. People who live with disadvantage make short-term decisions, which is very sensible. If, if you're offered something and it might disappear, you're mm. sensible to take it while you can. So... Um, Willpower, we just, it's sort of, it should have no, no there, is, there, is, it is, there is no space for it in the conversation about weight or diet. When it comes to exercise, it's, it's a bit more nuanced. If you train for the Tour de France, or you go, uh, I did a very long expedition in the Arctic, and actually I measured how much energy I burned, and I was burning eight to 10,000 calories every day. Mm. So you can do it for a short period of time. The kind of exercise that we all do, the activity of our lives, what we're pretty sure is that if you and I say as you know, men of similar age, height, build. If we went and lived in uh, in uh, West Africa, or sorry, in East Africa as, as hunter-gatherers, and this is what the data supports, we would not burn any more calories per day than we do working at our somewhat sedentary jobs yep. in central London. And the reason for that is, is very clever. The human body burns a very steady amount of calories every day. If you go for a run, you steal calories from other budgets. So one of the reasons we're so unhappy in our sedentary lives in central London is because we're burning 3,000 calories a day, but we have to spend the energy on anxiety, inflammation, elevated reproductive hormones, all these things that, that drive health problems. So exercise is incredibly good for you because it spends your inflammation budget on a run, which is what you've evolved to do, mm. but you still are burning 3,000 calories a day. So. Exercise is very good for you. It's not a big part of the pandemic of weight gain that we see in the UK. If everyone got off their screens and moved around a lot more, we might see things change by a few percentage points, maybe by 5-10%. But really, you know, 90% of the problem or more is, is what we eat. It's ultra-processed food. People who have become very used to looking at labels now to get information about the food that they're eating, one of the other demons over the years has been sugar, mm. or, or even just carbs, mm. uh, you know, full stop. Uh, and you write about why that is also not really the reason for the problem. Yeah, so when you're writing a book about food, like, you, you're in an argument, right? Because everyone reading that book has all their prejudices from childhood and being a grown-up. We all eat food, we all have a body, we, we sort of think we know what we're talking about. And certainly, I, and, and the book, writing the book, overturned a lot of my beliefs. So one thing I wanted to be really sure about was this idea that sugar is the problem. And I arrive at a, 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 a space which I think is pretty well evidenced now, which is that sugar is a huge problem. If you put sugar on your kid's breakfast cereal, they will eat more of it. So sugar does drive appetite and it drives weight gain, and it will also rot your teeth. And, and tooth decay is a terrible public health problem in this country. Mm. So sugar is harmful, but the sugar that you have at home that you just add to your home cooking is not doing you any great harm. It also washes over your teeth quite quickly. Sugar on breakfast cereal isn't a problem. It's the sugar in ultra processed products where it's balanced with acid and with salt and it's put in at extremely high levels uh, and it's often in formulations that stick to teeth. That's the sugar that's, that's really harmful. And sugar, the, the point I make in a, in a pretty labored way in the book 
is that a calorie of sugar is the same as a calorie of protein, is the same as a calorie of fat. And all the messing around we've done over the years with sort of keto diets, they don't, A, people don't seem very able to stick to them, and they don't seem to offer a health benefit over mm. a low fat diet. So we, whenever we look at the diets that people use, if you eat a very low fat diet or a keto diet or a paleo diet or a low sugar diet, what these diets generally involve is getting rid of ultra processed food, which mm. contains lots of fat and lots of sugar. And so that's why we think a lot of these diets work. So sugar's a problem, mainly in the context of UPF. And then having sort of established what isn't the problem, we sort of have to look at what, <laughs> what is the problem. And you, and you look at the sort of the food industry, uh, in the people who are making these foods, and you point out that it's a very complicated thing but my, my own suspicion has always been that, of course, companies will try and find the cheapest way in order to produce the food on the biggest scale in order to maximise their profits. And I always had this thing as I was a kid. I was like, why do walls make sausages and ice cream? I was like, what's going on in that factory? What's the connection between those two things? And then I started to worry about what was in ice cream. I was like, is that what you can't put in the sausage, basically? But there is this That's thing where... an amazingly sophisticated... <laughs> how old were you? Yeah. I don't know. I, was, I, must have, I don't know. I don't know how old, but old enough to be like, not enough to worry about it anyway. I kept eating the ice cream. But there is this thing where there are these companies who, of course, are incentivised to make the food as cheaply and as on as large a scale as possible. Is that basically the root of the problem? So a lot of my research now is with economists and we've, we're, we're trying to use the company's own financial data to prove that all the incentives within the companies are financial. So I, I did this in lots of ways. For the book, I went and interviewed you know, dozens of people in the food industry, from people who are selling uh, you know, the bars into the shops, through the loads of people in the product development labs, through to CEOs of, of massive companies. Mm. And they all say exactly the same thing, which is there are two ways of running your business. You need to hack down the cost of ingredients to you know, pennies per ton. So that's why if you're making ice cream, like having eggs in ice cream is a catastrophe. They've mm. got bugs in them. They're hard to handle. They go off. They're incredibly expensive. Someone has to keep a chicken and collect the eggs. If you can just use palm fat or uh, a synthetic emulsifier or carboxymethyl cellulose instead of your eggs and your dairy fats, you will save so much money. So there's hack down your ingredients costs and then the most important thing is to sell as much food as often as you possibly can. So many people at many companies confirm that in the development, I've seen this happen at some companies, um, in the development stage of a product, it's put to a big panel of people like us, and one of the things that is measured is how much you eat, and the other thing is how quick you eat it. Right. And the, the formulation of the cereal or the bread or the spread or whatever it is, that you eat the most of and you eat the quickest, that's what goes on the shelf. And it, it's not rocket science. I mean, if if you imagine yourself running a food company, this is what you have to do. Mm. Now, some people who've run food companies have tried to do other things. So famously, Emmanuel Faber at, at Danon and um, Indra Nui at Pepsi both said, oh, we're going to try and realign the portfolio and try and make things a bit healthier. And both were um, shoved out. So when, when you have the CEOs, you know, Emmanuel Faber was replaced by activist investors, by Bluebell Capital, who said, we've invested in Danon because we've got our investors' money, mm. and you can't just turn, you know, you're a business, you can't just start running a food charity, it's not the way it works. Mm. So um, when the CEOs lack the power to make the decisions, you, you realize if you're, if you're like me and you want to change the system, if you're, I suppose I am in, I'm an academic and I'm starting to act in a, in a sort of activist capacity or at least influence policy, you realize that shouting at the companies is fun it's important because you have to generate grassroots support for the idea these companies do do terrible, evil things. They commit atrocities, but you're not going to change the system by just shouting at the companies. You have to uh, look at the flow of money and interrupt it. So you need two things. You need people to stop buying the products. So that's one thing that the book is trying to bring about. But you need government to say, look, you, you have to stop making food in this way. We need to regulate everything about these products in a different way. And for the reader at home thinking what do I do personally I mean you've mentioned there's sort of the idea of sort of lobbying governments for, for action but in terms of how you eat food at home I mentioned my bread earlier that felt very healthy until I looked at the ingredients should I really have been working on my sourdough making skills during lockdown is that the only way to get decent food or is there a balance I've made one loaf of sourdough in my life like <laughs> life life is, my life is too short to be making sourdough now um, my invitation to all the readers of the book is to eat UPF while you read. 
So the evidence that these products are addictive is very good. And we have really good evidence from smoking trials that if you keep using your addictive substance, whether it's a cigarette or, or ultra-processed food, but you stop, for, you stop forbidding it and you start learning about it, especially about the companies that make it, why it's made, what it's made of, and you start tasting it and realizing that the gums and the modified corn starches that have replaced the good fats actually don't taste quite normal. The flavorings aren't normal. The emulsifiers create a weird mouthfeel. You can switch from finding the food very desirable to finding it very disgusting. Mm. And this was what happened to me in uh, writing the book and in doing uh, some of the, you know, I, I run a, 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 you know, I'm, I'm part of a research group that studies this food. So I was a participant, I was the first participant in this big study that we did. So I had to eat a diet of 80% ultra processed food for a month. And while I was eating the diet, it was this scientist in Brazil, Fernanda, who just kept saying to me, she said, you know, this is not food, Chris. It's an industrially produced edible substance. And she flicked this sort of switch in my brain. And it's the one thing in the book, there's a, there's a, a thing there. The meal I had that night was KFC hot wings. In the book, it's a turkey Twizzler because I'd already written about hot wings earlier. So you, you, you so everything in it is true, but just as a, as, a, as a point of fact, it was hot wings I ate that evening and she, I was unable to, to finish them. She, she'd done this sort of magic trick she hadn't yeah. meant to. So that's kind of the gift I want to give the reader is the only way you're going to understand this food is if you delve in and eat it and read your list of ingredients on your sandwich for lunch and on your Coke. And then maybe by the end of the book, you won't want to eat it anymore. But then life gets hard. Like it's, it may cost you more money. I have an unease. So one thing the book does not do is celebrate healthy food. Yep. There are no recipes in it. It's not selling you some program. And that's because I don't feel it's appropriate for me to say to anyone, here's what you should eat. I don't understand your budget. I don't know your heritage. I don't understand what you like. And, um, but I, I think there are lots of resources out there. And you've got a whole floor of books downstairs which are the, the, the companions to mine. You know, they're just all your recipe books. There is so much wonderful food in the world. And, you, you know, people, so people have said, oh, could you have, like, a resource of non-UPF recipes? I'm like, no, that is, all, that is all the cookbooks in the world, except for the ones that, you know, you make those cakes with sweets in them or whatever, right. you know. But broadly, if you're cooking at home, that's, that's the antidote. But it, it, will be, it will be a bit of a hassle. As you say, sort of, if it's an ingredient that's in your larder, it's probably not UPF. And if it's something that is longer to say than it is to eat, then it's... It's a, a good rule of thumb. And there are, some, there are some exceptions, you know, fortified flour has, you know, calcium carbonate in it, which, you know, is just, uh, it, it, they have to add it for calcium to flour. But, but broadly, it's a good rule of thumb, yeah. Chris, thank you for explaining some of that to me. Um, it's a worry that I, the last thing you've left me with is hot wings. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to come out of here and have to go and eat some hot wings. Go and eat them. And, you know, you can look up... Actually, KFC don't publish their ingredients in the UK, but you can look up the Canadian KFC ingredients. Okay. And you can... The question to ask yourself, is this this food? And for me, food is defined. Its purpose must be nourishment. Mm -hmm. So it's usually made by someone who actually cares about you in some way, you know, a partner, a child, a parent. And they do it to, to, to help you. And it's about building community, about reinforcing links with your culture, your heritage. That's what food should be. It's the substance that binds us all together. So is it food or is it an industrially produced edible substance that is commodifying your health and turning it into money for a very small number of shareholders of one of these big companies? That's the question. And a fine note on which to end. <laughs> Chris, thank you very much. Thanks, Will.